So yes, uh, we're talking about measuring code review in the Linux kernel, and I'll shortly say a few words to myself um, because both I'm working for Electrobit Automotive, um, and we're interested in using Linux and safety critical systems. And of course, one of the challenges is to understand why the kernel actually does implement certain functionality in a good way. Um, and if you have that kind of discussions with a number of kernel experts, they point out that the code review is the key to a lot of the quality assurance. So that kind of informal statement we want to actually uh, make measurable. With that I pass on to Bashak for the introduction. Um. Um, yeah, I am Bashak Ardomar. I am a data analyst, and this has been my master thesis work on the last winter semester at Technical University of Munich. And yeah, I think with that, I hand it back to Lucas. Unfortunately, I can't. Ah, oh, there we go. So, yes, well, I'll give a short introduction. As I said, we want to measure. And one of the key questions was, so take, you probably all know some part of the Linux kernel repository and you would say it's, it's really good. And then there are other parts in the Linux kernel repository where you might come across and you wonder, um, how could that code ever evolve in that direction? Um, and then you would think, well, okay, so there's really bad code and there's really good code in the kernel. So what, how could that happen? And one of the core aspects is, okay, code review would, was probably good in one place and cut in the other. And that would have to, that kind of influence that relates to quality. And for that, we want to, somehow measure this aspect. So right, just a quick overview that should be clear to everyone. Patches are sent to the mailing list, reviewed, um, picked up, and then they are sent to Linux to be integrated. And we are looking at this second step. Um, what is happening on the mailing list? And can we make that informal assessment uh, measurable? So we can start very easily by looking at the distribution of number of responses over patches, and um, that's going to be the focus. So we're looking at how many review emails is sent back to a patch, of course, excluding self responses, and we consider that the quality criteria. That's a rough estimation of what review really is, um, but it's a starting point in that. So more specifically, there were a number of research questions that I asked Bashak to look into um, on the on patch author specifically, right? Does what is really determining for a patch author if he gets a high number of responses? Um, is it the experience that that patch the, that that developer has? Um, is it relevant if you are a maintainer or not to get more or less responses? And um, does it matter if you have been active in that area versus not being active in that area? And of course, then you could also look at the patch that's itself and say, are there relevant aspects? If you change many files, is it relevant um, to that this patch touches various areas? And various areas means sending to various or changing files in multiple maintainer sections um, or sending it to more mailing lists. And of course, um, 
can we can we somehow see uh, some correlation there? Okay, and with that um, authoring activity, I pass on to Ashok. Thank you. Um, so the first thing we looked at was in in order to explain the amount of response, amount of review at, that a patch gets, we first looked into the author's experience and maybe the author, if an author is experienced, they are trusted to know what they are doing and not getting as many reviews or vice versa. So here on this graph, we can see the distribution of the number of responses. Um, I'm sorry, the active months, so the amount of experience in terms of time an author has. And as you can see here, there is a jump on the left side of the graph, meaning there are a lot of authors with one or zero months of experience or activity on the kernel. And we compare this measure with the amount of review the response emails their patches get. And as you can see, there is there wasn't very clear relationship. So we moved on to an alternative measure just to test the experience in another way which was the number of commits made by that author. And again, a similar distribution plot, this time it's log scale so that it's more readable, but many authors had committed to the kernel once and only once. And when we compared this measure again, we got a similar graph. It didn't really show a clear relationship with the reviews their patches get. We also looked into the companies these authors work for. We use the domain addresses their, of their email addresses so that we can match it to the companies. And here you see the most, so the top companies that hire the largest number of people on the kernel, depending on that domain address. And the graph is also colored according to the activity of those authors, so how many months they have been active for. And as you can see, many dark red colors on the graph, meaning many authors had a shorter period of experience on the kernel specifically. And with that, I hand it back to Lucas again for the one time committers. Yes, so we've seen that one time committers is significant group of um, people contributing. So we were interested in how, what are they doing and uh, trying to understand um, what the characteristics of them are or if there are certain characteristics. And what we looked at is, we looked at various things, but pointing out just some the most interesting aspects we found out. Um, and we could look at the patches they uh, submitted and we identified the sections that they contributed to and here you can see the, the popular sections among them um, just two points i think one is uh, the staging subsystem is the uh, topmost area so obviously greg's advertisement as well as others in the community to start contributing and staging has been quite successful in that at least one-time committers do one patch there and potentially follow up or just leave again. Um, I think another uh, interesting one is that uh, if we look at them, uh, this uh, hid IDs, uh, H5 is the most most contributed one. Again, si single people contribute uh, identifiers for some, some, some devices and, and then move on from there. Or uh, as well as uh, maintainers, the maintainers file is only touched uh, once by a, by a person, probably entering themselves as a reviewer and then never actually following up with uh, contributions 
in form of patches, but um, being active as a reviewer. So that gave us some insight in what one-time committers do. And uh, another class of interesting uh, developer developers are, of course, maintainers. So similarly, we were asking ourselves, does it make a difference if I'm a maintainer or not in the feedback that I get on the mailing list? So we extract the maintainers from maintainer file and actually 11 percent of the authors that you can see are actually maintainers and we also identified that maintainers actually receive a larger portion of responses than their uh, authoring activity would suggest um, and the question now is is that actually significant um, and for that we also looked at in which uh, mailing lists um, is are these maintainers um, um, actually also more active than on others in average you can say 14 percent of the uh, patches sent are actually authored by maintainers um, but there's quite some uh, differences between different mailing lists um, kvm uh, being one where actually the maintainers are a bit more active um, than uh, in other subsystems. So to identify if um, a maintainer actually gets significantly more responses than um, a, a non-maintainer, uh, we have to look at the two histograms of maintainers and of the others and then make a statistic test. Um, and the distributions aren't normal, so you need to apply a parametric rank sum test and then identify the difference. I'm not a statistician, so I trust Asha that she did that in a solid way in her master thesis. And she um, identified that um, the there is evidence in the data to reject that they get the same number of uh, same average number of responses so um, we know that maintainers actually do get more, more um, responses than um, others and with that um, i think i'll just hand over to Asha. Okay. So the next thing we looked at was the patches themselves instead of focusing off at the author. And the first thing we investigated was how many files does this patch proposes to change and does that have any effect which proved to be not very defining in terms of the number of responses and Another thing, does it mean if I am sending my patch to many mailing lists, does it mean for me that I will get more review or more responses? And here on the histogram, you can see the distribution of the number of mailing lists over patches. So the histogram shows that many patches were sent to a single mailing list. However, there are many also being sent to multiple lists. And if we look at the relationship with the amount of review they get, we again couldn't conclude that there is a clear correlation between the two, negative or positive. And we started to focus on the individual mailing list. So maybe some single mailing list has more effect than the other. So we shouldn't look at the number of them. So since many many patches were sent to a single mailing list, the first thing we looked into was which are those mailing lists and the most active mailing lists showed up on this. Here are the most here are the most active lists in terms of most isolated 
and we look at the individual list and their corresponded average number of responses when a patch is sent to those lists and here we can see a range of different averages but it is also important to consider that some of the patches were sent to multiple lists so there it will affect multiple averages that we see on this graph mm. we then look into what mailing lists are then going together so if a patch is sent to one what's the probability that is it is sent to the other list and here is a zoomed in graph with some selected mailing list and we are seeing the heat map of what mailing lists go together in patches we can see here for example the linux arm kernel list and device tree kernel um, again kernel or were quite often going together and which makes it a challenge to measure the effects of these individual lists on the amount of response harder so we moved on to the another approach instead of trying to measure individual lists we cluster the patches together using the mailing list they are sent to and try to measure the effect of those clusters, being in a cluster but not the other. Does it have an effect on the amount of review that patch gets? And for this, we formed 32 clusters of patches and each cluster would have their own characteristics in terms of what mailing lists are frequent on those clusters. And we compare those clusters in terms of average number of response a patch within those clusters get. And on this graph, you can see the averages for each of the clusters. And this is when this is tested to see is it statistically significant that being in a cluster and not the other makes a difference in terms of the amount of response that patch will get. And the test actually concluded that, yes, it does matter, but as you can see in terms of absolute numbers, the response will not be, so the difference of response will not be huge. And for bots, I hand it again to Lucas. Yeah, so one one last uh, topic that uh, we're looking into is of course question on um, not only humans respond but also bots respond to, to patches and as you can see roughly eight percent of the responses are actually from bot uh, emails and uh, we were interested in okay what what are the certain characteristics that we can expect from there so of course we can start easily by asking ourselves if um, the number of responses sent by bots uh, um, is growing or decreasing over time um, interestingly you can see that the number of bot responses is actually at the moment quite stable over the time from 2018 to 2020 um, and it's roughly correlated of course with the activity that's uh, ongoing um, actually it has been decreased the, the, yeah, the, the number of uh, hot emails has actually decreased in, in the last six months of that um, of the time that we considered but I don't think that that's a significant trend um, that, that is worth noting so um, bots are out there um, and we um, identified a number of bots probably known to many uh, there is 
the, the most active bot is the patch bot that sends emails on the Intel GFX mailing list. Um, sending out about 17,000 emails. Um, then there's a bot from, from, from Mark Brown that is active on the also mailing list, um, sending out a number of responses. Kernel test robot, anyone that writes non compilable code is going to get a response. And then we have, of course, the tip bots and the uh, spot um, pointing out um, and providing a, yeah, replies to, 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 to people. Um, but uh, what we can see is that actually right, um, most uh, bots are actually um, sending out quite a few emails, um, except a few um, exceptions that we just uh, pointed out. Um, and then we were interested in um, to which mailing lists would actually send um, emails. And um, we looked at how this is distributed. There are a few mailing lists where they do a significant contribution um, and others where they're basically non-existent. And we can, we can look at that a bit more in detail. Uh, again, what we're showing here are relative um, numbers. So you'll find out on, on, on Linux tip commits, most of the emails are uh, from a bot. Not surprising, that's a mailing list dedicated for um, responses from a bot. Uh, on the Intel GFX mailing list, I just pointed out right there, we have the patch. Uh, patchwork bot answering on also Mark Brown's bot is answering and um, um, yes overall you can see that about 12 percent of the emails are, are actually uh, sent by um, oh, wait sorry um, uh, yes so the uh, Twelve percent are actually sent to uh, Alza Devil and into uh, GFX, so it doesn't mean that that's a representative um, a representation of what is really going on in the um, in the whole uh, community. Yes, and I think with that we are at the end of a lot of things that we just went through. Um, so in retrospective, after we did all these evaluations, um, the question remains, so did we find out that code review is, um, is a quality criteria and can we see significant differences? The, the challenge that we identified is just looking at the plain numbers and believing that one part is better uh, reviewed than another um, turned out to be um, false. It, 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 even if that hypothesis is true, it's not reflected just in the number of responses. There must be more to that, um, to that review process that is reflected otherwise. And I think uh, that is still something that is open and interesting as to follow up. But uh, the first uh, let's say observations, the first measurements we made um, didn't uh, give us that first conformance um, of just the number of reviews that matters. Um, other than I'd say that is it's not a big surprise, um, but we're at we, we tried something and we, uh, I think we learned a lot uh, by looking at that data and hopefully that is also interesting for others to um, understand what's going on in the community and, and uh, get an, an overview. Um, 
how measurements and intuition can somehow sometimes meet and sometimes actually uh, dis disagree with each other. Yeah, I think with that, we're ready for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Bashak and, and Lucas. I was wondering, maybe, Lucas, if you want to cover some of the points you're discussing in the chat directly. There were there were some additional comments there. Maybe they'll invite some people to participate and ask a few questions as well. And uh, sure. Len just asked a question. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, oh, and okay. Yeah, so um, I think one of the critical questions is, of course, um, how did you even consider patches, uh, the responses to patches? Um, so what we are using, there's a presentation, I think, from Linux Plumbers two years ago, where we were looking at ignored patches. We're using um, a heuristics that, um, that relates uh, individual patches to um, the commit that is integrated upstream and that relates um, similar patches that we believe are from different versions to each other and we then aggregate on that it uses a um, heuristics um, that is is has been uh, evaluated and it has some precision so you can look into a precision recall and that was measured. So there's going to be a, a, a certain amount of flaw in that in, in the data, but basically we're confident that we did not actually uh, correct. And I think in that relation, one thing that we do need to point out is that we look at individual patches and the response to that patch. Of course, people send patch series and the patch series by itself might get a response that applies to all of the patches and that's something that we didn't take um, into account as of now uh, again that's just uh, i think some technical uh, challenge to extend um, the, the, the models that we have to um, consider patch series as some kind of collective set, to relate patch series to each other as they evolve and um, understand what a, how to measure the response to a complete series as a response to individual patches. Uh, and and you'd have to actually recognize that like it would have to be a response to patch zero or something, right? Yes, I mean, that is well, right? Uh, understanding the structure of, of such a patch series as well as already a technical challenge. And um, given that we're doing this with uh, efforts with master pieces and, and academic resources, um, yeah, there are limits to, to to how much effort we can really put into that. But yes, that would be an interesting follow-up question. Does it change if you look at patch series instead? Yes, yeah, so maybe I'll quickly go through the comments. Um, so, of course, what we did when we said maintainers, we basically said anyone that's entered with an M entry in the maintainers file is a maintainer. You might correctly say that um, there are some people that have much more responsibility, although they only are mentioned once in the maintainers file, um, because they are responsible for a huge uh, part of of the kernel versus maybe some maintainer that is just 
maintaining a single file and, and, and has an entry for that. So of course, already the 11% of maintainers is not a, a group that has a very similar contribution and review characteristics. And the, the question would be if, if you somehow take that into account, how much responsibility some maintainer has, that well, makes a difference as well. I think the question is, is did the maintainer write a patch against their own subsystem or against somebody else's? And those are sort of two different animals, right? Yes. So in our in the data we showed, we assume that a maintainer, so when we say a maintainer gets a response, we mean he send the patch to his own, to his area of responsibility, and that's a maintainer patch. If that maintainer yeah. sends a patch to a different area of responsibility, he's a contributor just as anyone else. Okay, good. But of course, yes, you would, you could start classifying the, the types of maintainers and, and if that makes a difference. But um, So tell, tell me if I get the, uh, you know, sort of the, the bottom line, you, and that is it's between one and two responses per patch is sort of generally what we see over I think yes yeah so the average the average response that you get is I think one dot three responses um, per patch um, and then you can try to determine the relevant factors to that but as you have seen um it's quite difficult to pinpoint that to so yeah to quality the other thing is sometimes things hit the list and they already have reviewed by tags on them they've been reviewed before they go in the list right so i mean when i saw the title of this talk um that's actually what i thought you would be tracking you would be tracking reviewed by tags rather than mailing list responses I think I think maybe we actually investigated that as well um, at some point, um, but I also think that Donald's not everybody uses uh, those. And yeah, some, uh, yeah. Yes. Often and, and they're not added. Yeah, and it's actually a smaller data set than the actual responses. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and, and all right. So the larger the data set, the the more you can actually use data analytics methods. And I think that's why we consider that um, the more interesting question. Yeah. Taking review by is interesting, but probably uh, Jonathan. It might be a 5 percenter rather than a 90 percenter, right? Yeah. So a patch that got one response and has 15 reviewed buys on it when it shows up in the list maybe should be counted as <laughs> more than one response. But looking at just reviewed buys would be too myopic, perhaps. Yeah, so yes, and of course you can ask the question, how is reviewed by and the responses related to each other? Um, that might also be interesting, but. I don't think we look into that. So today. sometimes, I mean, I don't do a lot of maintaining anymore, but I used to sometimes when there's just a lot of patches and I just, it, it's right, I just take it and I check it in and I don't reply and I might reply en masse or to these days it's done, you know, by a tip bot that says stuff's checked in. So it never actually gets a response on the list. Um, so there, there could be zeros in there as well as as ones, right? Yes, and I think if we look at the very first uh, slides, you will see the word we have. A lot of zeros. Yes, we actually have a lot of zeros. Um, give me a second. Yeah, please. that's actually pretty interesting. So that sort of calibrates this entire notion of looking at these, I mean, that's a logarithmic scale, right? Um, I, I can't find the graph as of now. Well, I think, you, I think you hit it and you had, uh, isn't that one zero number of files? Oh, that's number of files, sorry. Yeah. Um, 
No, I can't find it out uh, now, but uh, we certainly looked at that and it's exactly as you said, um, right? We see those graphs that are really skewed to the left um, and zero is, is basically quite often in there. Um, um, can I hand it? Um, can I take it over? Yeah, oh, yeah. fine. So yeah, I think the, as you said, the zero is actually default, and we try to understand why zero is, is, is among them. But again, that's yeah. Uh, so in this graph, is zero have zero entries or is zero the top thing? I can't tell. How do I read that? Um, zero has zero entries because we filtered out the self responses that included the patch itself. Okay, so zero is not plotted here. No. <laughs> okay. But I think it was one of the the, the highest num the highest number actually in that that graph. And, yes. Um, and, and that's uh, that sort of puts this whole methodology in context, right? Yeah. So it could be there's ten times as many patches that that the maintainer says, yeah, I'll take it, and they check it in, and they, it's never any discussion. Yes, and then we have and then we have seen um, we have seen that um, uh, I think that was one of the first surprises that. Even if maintainers send something to a, their own subsystem, um, in often cases they also don't get a response. So sure, um, yeah. I mean, a lot of patches are pretty obvious, and some of them are routine. Unfortunately, there was a whole thing where somebody was, you know, sneaking stuff into the kernel this way a, a while ago, right? In the last year or so, just to see if stuff unreviewed code could get into the kernel, and the answer was, yeah, it could. Yes, but of course, um, once you're say once you're a stronger maintainer, you're not even forced to send it on the list. I think that's another question that we investigated in the past. Um, and yeah, I have to say I've been guilty of that too. Not too often. Yeah. I mean, usually I'd send stuff like an FYI. This is what I just checked in. It depends on what the th what the thing is, right? If it's a utility, then it's perfectly fine to do that. But for part of the kernel mode, less so. Yes, I think that that has been more or less the fun in, in looking at it. Yeah, that's actually the bigger so that that's actually the bigger context setting observation, and that is, oh, of all the commits that were checked into Git, which ones you couldn't find on the list ever? Yes, and that's an investigation. So that's an investigation we presented. Um, was it two years or two years ago in Lisbon? Um, and I think there's a there's also a paper um, that describes um, how many of those that we could identify are security fixes um, that haven't been publicly discussed discussed. <laughs> um, and, and, and it gives Getting us some kind of into the kernel. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I can point you to the resource of that. Um, that's interesting. Again, for those people on the security mailing list, that's not a surprise. Um, but it's interesting to see that with data analytics methods, you can actually uh, find in the we called it the, it's this uh, sound of silence, right? You can actually right. identify this due to the silence there's, of something. There's, there's real things going on in that silent. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. true. Mm -hmm. And security is just one of them, I'm sure. There's a lot of things that are just like, that just went, went in and maintainer's discretion, call it. Yeah. And, and Yes, if that is an actual risk or not is, I think, a completely different question. But um, certainly, you, these kind of investigations help to understand uh, the processes also more from a quantitative perspective than just a qualitative one, where you ask people 
right. what needs to be changed or improved or? So, I mean, if you really wanted to be rigorous about this, then it would be required, but technically it's not. There's no rule that says, you know, there are, there are a lot, there are systems which formalize this, right? There's a lot of code review, there's various mechanisms people use to check into different trees other than the kernel where you need a certain number of acts, you need a certain number of reviewed buys, you know, you need you need all that stuff. But here it's really up to the maintainer, right? It's a human making that decision and they don't have to go by a formal um, mechanism that says, oh, you need this many reviews before you're allowed to upstream a patch. Um, yes, and I think, uh... I think the, 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 data, the data supports that kind of hypothesis that you have. And um, of course, I think this would be follow up questions like, can we actually extract, um, let's say, the, the common practice of certain subsystems? Uh, who needs to actually? I imagine you can because those are people, those subsystems are people and they all have different work, you know, routines. But yeah, that's not something we uh, looked into that particularly yet. Well, you know, it'd be easier just to ask them, <laughs> honestly, right? I mean, what methodology do you follow? And there's a couple of different ways to skin this cat. It's a hard job being a maintainer. People are sending you code 24-7, um, and people have different techniques. That's You could probably hold, write an entire paper on what's it like to be a maintainer and what, what the BKMs are and how they're evolving. And should there be more structure such that there's more uniformity? It's a good question. There's one yeah. interesting sort of related thing, which is whether maintainers will tweak a patch. Did some some people will push back and say, no, 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 you must send another version to fix yeah. the typo. I have to say that I've fi I've rewritten a lot of commit messages without oh, yeah. without you know a lot of sometimes you have to translate it into something because people use the commit messages, but but yeah, when you tweak the actual code, yeah, I have to say I have, but then you'd usually put a note on that says you know like on the bottom that you actually, because if you screwed it up, you shouldn't be blaming it on the original author. <laughs> yeah, no, I always ask them to check it, but sometimes in the way of things, it's gone upstream before they get around to looking. I find that um, the thing that I do the most or have done the most is translate the commit messages into English. Yeah, yeah like it, it just, I don't know, there's a lot of coders who English isn't their first language and they wrote a great patch but they didn't describe it very well. I also do that fairly frequently, and sometimes I find that it's necessary to use Google Translate to translate it from semi-English <laughs> back to their native language and then back to English. Oh, that's funny. That's it, it, in some cases, it works because <laughs> they do the same thing I would do. I mean, if I was trying yeah. to write in, I don't know, Thai or something like that, I would use, I definitely use English syntax and substitute Thai words. That is, And that is there are some languages where you can get away with that pairs and other ones where I'm sorry, but yeah, yeah, there's English words here, but I have no idea what this is. Yeah, that's funny. I figure it's, uh, I figure it's a give and take. I mean, I am uh, fortunate to be born as an English native speaker in this time and place. And uh, therefore, one of my responsibilities is to help other people who aren't. Of course. Yeah, it's not a punitive thing. It's a, it's a, it's certainly definitely a supportive thing. Yes, and I think to one of the comments from, from from you, Len. Well, it's easier to just ask the maintainers on something rather than going through with data analytics to to extract that information. Uh, I agree. Right? It, it is easier. Um, the question is, of course if maintainers are overloaded, if they are interested in filling out surveys on what they do and, and why they do that, and what do they, they expect in return. Um, so certainly well, I'm happy to to, to, to There's a maintainer summit, of, right? There's a maintainer yeah. summit where at least a subset of maintainers get together and they and, and it's focused on methodology and, and this would be a, an apt kind of topic, right? What what rules are we following? 
what conventions are we following, which ones are mandatory and which ones are optional. Um, and knowing those rules would really set you up for are your data analytics going to work or not? Oh, mm -hmm. look, this guy's breaking the rules. Oh, look, this guy's, these guys are following the rules. Um, and since they're following the rules, we can know the following about how the, how the process is working. I yes, think it's a matter of time before this becomes more formal. I think it's really a matter of time. So yes, if if the, the, I mean the moderators and participants of the maintainer summit want to take that point with them and say, okay, let's see if we can twenty five people in a room agree on seven aspects that that they actually do in that regard, and. Uh, then that would be certainly interesting because it gives us somehow a qualitative statement. Interestingly as well is that we did that partially as well for some aspects and we were sometimes surprised that if you do the data analytics it indicates something else. Right? It, um, uh, the, the, the data just says something else, right? People say, well, I'm actually getting more patches uh, over the years. And then you look at the data and you find out, well, they're actually getting less. But uh, somehow. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think for, for a poll, really what you want to do is an in, you probably just want to interview five high volume maintainers. And that would give you 90% of, 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 of the world. Yeah. So if you got. 10 minutes of Greg KH's time, who is on this call, that would be worth many minutes of many other people's time. Yes, thanks for Greg pointing out. Of course, there's a maintainer entry profile that all maintainers should write to understand what they do and how they work. Unfortunately, I also know that we basically have after uh, Dan asked for it, writing that, we have five, maybe we have four, five, six. Um, getting more of them would be, of course, nice because then we can uh, get data from a qualitative perspective, personal opinions of people, and and have that uh, fit to, of course, the data analytics that we do that also has significant flaws in various aspects. I think guys wants to tell us that our time is up. <laughs> I, I, I let the company and the conversation go on as good as Bashak and Lucas, thank you so much. Thank you um, to everyone else for participating. I um, Greg actually posted a few messages on, on the chat room as well. So I think I think you might even need less than 10 people. Apparently five would do. <laughs> um, even four uh, were dwindling down. Thank you so, so very much again for the presentation. Again, the slides are available for download. I invite everybody to get a copy of that. There's a lot of charts in there that might be easier to look at offline. And if you miss the beginning of the presentation, you'll be able to watch it live in our playbacks on YouTube. With that, and that concludes. Maybe one, one last pointer as well. And of course, Go ahead. I said that's a master thesis. The master thesis should also be available on the uh, Linux kernel conf page, um, and you can read through that, understand in more detail what we measured and um, where the, let's say, uh, the, where the potential validity might be invalidated. You're saying that's already linked there in the um, in the presentation? It's linked there if I'm not wrong. If not, we'll make sure that it's added to the materials and people can find it there. Um, and Yes, that would be fantastic. 